BBC One, Charles. In the Red continues tomorrow at 9. the World Cup here, this channel, this time, next week. See you then. We'll be back with another party on July the 15th. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, kids. What does it mean to me? Entertainment. Passion. Pride. What does it mean to me? The world on ITV. Wherever there's football, we're in your corner. MasterCard. At ESSA, we monitor over 13,000 of our competitors' fuel prices every day and report them into the ESSO Price Watch Center, where we adjust our own prices so they're usually among the lowest in your neighborhood. ESSO Price Watch. We keep watching, so you keep saving. What an evening, and what a show. Much more than a show, a celebration of the mighty musical talent that has lit up the stages of the world. Members of original casts, guests, friends, in an all-star display at the Royal Albert Hall to celebrate Andrew Lloyd Webber's 50th birthday, Sunday at 10.15 on ITV. Now on Central ITV, Diana, the secrets behind the crash. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. Princess of Wales. The Princess of Diana. The Princess of Wales. 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 It seems extraordinary after all this time that people still want to come and see where it happened, to leave messages, to lay flowers. It says an amazing amount about what Diana meant to people. But it's a very strange feeling for me to come here to know that this is where it all ended. The sadness doesn't uh, go away. Many people will say that surely it's time to let the dead rest in peace, and that's quite understandable. 
But to come to Paris is to learn that there are many important unanswered questions about what happened on that terrible night. Immediately after the accident, things seemed reasonably straightforward. High on a cocktail of drink and drugs, the driver lost control, slamming their Mercedes into the 13th concrete pillar inside this tunnel. Amazingly, though, despite nine months of investigation and the questioning of dozens of witnesses, there are now more questions than answers, and the French judge in charge seems no further forward. In two days' time, he's calling many of the key witnesses back together again for what's called a confrontation, to try to make sense of it all. But this is a story full of mystery. The police have still not found many who were there at the time. Witnesses talk of a mysterious flash in the tunnel and powerful motorbikes leaving at high speed. And as we've discovered, the man at the wheel, Henri Paul, was leading an extraordinary double life. In public, he was security manager at one of the world's most famous hotels, the Ritz, in Paris. In private, he was a secret agent in regular contact with the French and other intelligence services. The south of France. For generations, it's been the playground for the seriously rich and famous. And wherever they go, the paparazzi are never too far behind. Last August, Diana took a second holiday here with Dodi Fayed, the playboy son of Mohammed Al Fayed, the owner of Harrods. Okay, Mr. Oster. For the world's media, this new romance was the only story that counted. She was easily the most famous and most photographed woman in the world. There had been a decent interval after her divorce from Prince Charles, and the media pack could smell marriage in the air. Her former lover, the cavalry officer James Hewitt, now lives a quiet life in the West Country. Despite the fuss over a book about their affair with which he'd cooperated, they had kept in touch. I spoke to her about four months previous to that, actually. She seemed to be happy in what she was doing. Did she say anything about her private life? She you? said, I said, you know, what are you going to do next? And um, she said, oh, I'm going to shock the world and... Um, I going to find a, a, a big black man and marry him, um, which is, uh, you know, showed through her sense of humour. She liked to tease and um, and to shock people in a, in a in a humourly way like that. Princess Diana always had a very ambivalent attitude towards the press, particularly the photographers. They were very useful when she wanted attention for activities like her landmines campaign or when she wanted to upstage her former husband. But by last summer, as her romance blossomed, things began to change. She always made it quite clear that she would like to, to marry and to, to settle down and have a, a family and try and, and lead a normal, quiet life. She stayed with us for a couple of weeks in the Thousand of France. She enjoyed and had children, enjoyed the best holiday they can ever enjoy. You see, so the normal, ordinary people life, you know, which is no formalities, no, you know, just the way you enjoy life in a normal family way, close family way, which unfortunately she never enjoyed during her life, during her parents, during her marriage, you know. Their holiday over at the end of August, Diana and Dodi decided to go to Paris for an overnight stay before returning to London. But by the time they reached Le Bourget, an airport just outside Paris, the paparazzi were already waiting. Here, catching Diana and bodyguard Trevor Reese jones Dodi and one of their drivers, Henri Paul. On the way into Paris, there were two near misses. Both times, a paparazzi weaved in and out of their convoy. Twice, Henri Paul, who was driving the backup vehicle, managed to swerve and avoid an accident. Diana was horrified and said she was worried that one of the paparazzi would get killed the way they were behaving. 
At 3.45, Diana and Dodie arrived at the Windsor Villa, just on the outskirts of Paris. Hello, it's Nicholas Owen from ITV. Oh. Ah, Good morning. Morning, Nicholas Hi. Owen. Yeah, you're expected. Uh, Mr. Matan's at the main gate there for you. Oh, Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Diana and Dodie were greeted by Gregorio Matin, who has been the butler here most of his adult life. The villa is the former home of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, a previous refuge abroad for another glamorous and stylish woman who had married into the royal family and, like Princess Diana, would never be queen. What about Dodi? Did he like this house? I mean, what do oh, you? Oh yeah, sure. He liked it very much. He liked it. He liked it very much. It's a beautiful house. Uh, I tell you, this house in the summer it always is beautiful, but particularly in the summer is extraordinary. So you expected Dodi? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And Diana to live in this house yeah, together? Yeah, absolutely. Everything is ready for to come here. He he prepared the house. Uh, all ready. All is ready. We see this somebody move all the furniture, somebody come where a designer, you know, it's, it's, it's the new people come, it's, 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 it's clear, huh? Tell me, do you remember the, the, the last day they came here? Yeah, 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 sure. Do you remember them coming? Do you remember what happened? He, he, he's coming and see the house, spend two hours if all around the house to visit everything, everything. You go, the, the, in the top uh, until the basement and the kitchen the, for the canal to the dogs and the, everything, the garden. Yeah, sure. What did you think of them together? How did they seem together? I think really is a very beautiful couple. Dodi decided, you know, and she decided that this is the place she loved. She finds that this is the place for her, and a very secure place, and it's just near London. She will be at home, and it's just the right uh, nest for them to continue their happiness and continue their life, but they're gone. You could imagine them living in that place? Yeah. It was just the right place for them. From the Windsor Villa, they went across Paris to the Ritz Hotel, also owned by Dodi's father, Mohamed Al Fayed, where they checked into the Imperial Suite. At 6.30, Dodi went across the square to pick up a ring for Diana. After the excitement of the previous week in the south of France, there was no big money to be made by the paparazzi, unless this was to be the night a very special announcement would come. Many close to Dodi, including his butler, are sure this was to be the night. With these people, you can reach the top. You know, you can make records, records, or you can make nothing. So the answer is in between, meaning that it depends on the type of picture that you would have been able to get. A picture inside the hotel is out of the question because we never go inside hotels, yeah? So it would have to be outside, what are you going to get outside? Even if they pose and they smile at us, you know. I tell you what, the best picture would have been uh, after dinner, Dodi offers, ask her uh, to marry him, give her a ring, she comes out and she shows the ring. Then you've got a picture. And even if there was just the slightest chance of this picture, none of the photographers was going to leave early that night. At seven o'clock, Diana and Dodie left the Ritz and went to Dodie's apartment at the top of the Champs-Élysées, about five minutes' journey away by car. The growing army of paparazzi was waiting for them when they arrived. After a struggle on the pavement outside, they got through to this door, for this is Dodie's apartment. We have been allowed to film inside the first film crew here. It's the sumptuous flat that the son of the Harrods billionaire hoped Diana would share with him. Relations with his powerful father were not always easy. Dodie had made his own mark in the glamorous world of movie stars. A rich playboy, but one who had enjoyed some success commercially as a Hollywood film producer. 
It's a home full of the possessions of a man born into the privilege of wealth and conspicuous consumption. The high-speed boat, the tasteful antiques. At the chic end of Paris, in the shadow of the Arc de Triomphe, it's a place that should have been a haven from hostile outsiders. But outside the tranquility of Dodie's luxury apartment that night, the pressure was now building up. At 9.30, they had planned to eat at a fashionable restaurant, but the throng of paparazzi and other hangers-on made this impossible. They gave up and went to the Ritz to eat. They don't just only take him photographs, but also they, they, you know, they accompany you, they stand in your way, the motorcycles are in front of you, it's just devastating. One of the paparazzi there that night was Pierre Sue caught here, hanging around outside the Spice Girls Hotel in Paris last month. Travelling on motorbikes and scooters, these photographers are quick and mobile. Dodging in and out of the traffic with high-speed cameras and long lenses, they're every inch the modern urban hunter. We jump off the motorcycle and we get in place to shoot them. A few of us had time to take a picture through the window at that time, and one or two frames, and then the door opened, the Princess Diana uh, exit before, and Dodi behind her, a few meters behind, and they went into the hotel. How would you describe the way the Princess reacted to what you were doing? Nothing special, really, you know, she kept her head straight and walked and didn't talk to us, didn't seem part particularly annoyed or anything. But this video shot by the Ritz security cameras tells a very different story. One photographer is already inside the lobby. As they arrive at the front door, a second photographer steps in front of Diana and manages to take a picture before being grabbed and thrown out. A grim-faced Diana then enters the hotel, followed by the bodyguard Kez Wingfield, a few steps behind her boyfriend Dodie, and Trevor Reese jones According to one of the bodyguards, she then sat down and burst into tears. Shortly afterwards, Henri Paul parks his binny outside the Ritz. It's just after 10 o'clock in Paris, 9 o'clock in London. Henri Paul, whose main job was acting head of security at the Ritz, had been called on his mobile and came back into work. One mystery still unresolved is where he was during the evening, having left work just after seven. Once inside, he drank two glasses of Ricard, an alcoholic aperitif, in the bar. But I saw some uh, maid, probably, from the hotel through a first floor window, shutting down curtains, so we assumed that they were going to have dinner at the first floor, which is the Imperial Suite or something. So then we, s we s realized that uh, we will have to wait a couple of hours, maybe. Inside the Ritz, Diana and Dodi had dinner in the Imperial Suite. So then they called me, say, what's happening? And then we're having dinner, and after that, going back to the apartment. And uh, we're coming back on Sunday and on Monday. They were dec declared their engagements. Did Dodie tell you that? Did Diana Dodie tell you that? Dodie told me that, and Diana told me that on Saturday evening at 10 o'clock in the hotel. Did Diana speak to you in that conversation? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember what she actually said to you? She was completely full of happiness, full of joy. At the end of the road, you know, she find someone she can feel, you know, fill her life and be happy and uh, fulfill all her dreams, which she lost and she missed for years. She find the family she can be, you know, related to. This amateur video captures the mood outside the Ritz that evening. 
Inside, Diana and Dodi decided to return to his apartment. According to Mohammed al Fayed, his son rang him in some anguish. By now, it's just after midnight. I say, just be careful. Uh, don't take any decision because if you're happy in the hotel, stay in the hotel. If you feel going out, you, you can do it, just, you know, uh, it's all up to you. I left it to him to decide. But Dodi came up with a plan. A decoy vehicle would go to the front of the Ritz. Meanwhile, they would escape by the back door. The Ritz security video shows the couple's black Mercedes, supplied by a local hire company, being brought round for them. But they never stood a chance. Princess Diana tried to escape photographers as, <coughs> as much as she can, you know. So therefore, this is a natural thing to do, to go to check the back door. So that's why some photographers went into the back. So uh, both uh, ways were secure, so to speak. 19 minutes past 12. At the back of the Ritz, Diana and Dodi slip into the black Mercedes. Henri Paul takes over at the wheel. But the paparazzi monitor their every move and alert each other on mobile phones. Even the crowd knew what was going on. On the tourist video, you can hear what is happening. They're chasing Princess Diana. This is where the journey began. Rear entrance to the Ritz there. Where the princess and Dodie joined Henri Paul, the chauffeur, and Trevor Reese Jones, the bodyguard, and they set off down the Rue Cambon, narrow back street. And we're turning right. Within a minute, they were ambushed just around the corner at the Place de la Concorde. According to one key witness who spoke to the police, there were many paparazzi surrounding the car. One photographer on a motorbike was taking pictures of Diana and Dodie in the back of the Mercedes. At some lights, a car in front held them back before they set off at speed towards the tunnel. But this car, this is a Mercedes very similar to the sort that the Princess and the others were in, a really powerful machine. You just know it's itching to get going. You feel invincible in it, obviously very, very well built having difficulty holding it back, to be absolutely honest. There's a slip road on the right-hand side about to come in and join us just at the mouth of the tunnel. Anything coming out of there, you're really in difficulties. And then you get this strange kick to the left, kick, kick to the left, and even at this speed, there's a bit of a throwing over to the left and then to the right. If you lurch across the road, anything goes wrong, disaster. There's no protection in terms of any guardrail. Anybody who just deviates from the road only has to go a couple of feet onto the curb and you've got a solid accident taking place. It's the classic case where a guardrail of some kind would turn a serious crash into a mere deflection. You should put up guardrails, it's not at all expensive. You could put it in for about 10 or 12 pounds per foot. If there'd been a guardrail in this tunnel last August, then nobody would have died at all. Instead, the Mercedes, with only one person, Trevor Reese Jones, who was to be the only survivor wearing a seatbelt, hurtled into a tunnel which was a death trap. The record for that tunnel is 13 deaths before this accident took place last August, uh, in the last dozen years or so. And even since the deaths last August, nothing has been done to make the tunnel safe. But that night, two young people had a lucky escape. Suad Mufakir and Mohamed Majadi were leaving the tunnel when they heard the Mercedes braking heavily behind them. I got the impression that the car was right behind us, judging by what I could see in my rear view mirror. So I accelerated so as to put some distance between us, to get away and to avoid being hit. The whole thing happened really quickly, really, really quickly. I heard a car braking repeatedly. 
which is what made me turn around. And at that moment, that's when I saw the car hit the pillar. The investigating judge believes that as he approached the tunnel, Henri Paul saw a slow-moving white Fiat Uno. He tried to get round it, but clipped the side of the car, lost control, and skidded into the 13th pillar. The Fiat Uno then drove away. This is not the end of the story, though, rather the beginning of an extraordinary mystery. For a start, that Fiat Uno has still not been found. for everyone. Tell us all about it. It's all down to Uncle Ben's new two-step, really. I wanted to try out this unique new Chinese cooking sauce, so I thought, who better? The sauce is split into two layers, you see. You just spoon the top layer of ingredients into a pan and fry the spices to release the flavor, just like they do in a restaurant. Then stir-fry the meat and add the bottom layer. And what did they think? They were head over heels. They asked me to join in. New two-step sauces. Sorry. Perfect every time. Don't let skin problems affect your life. Neutrogena Clear Pore Treatment. Clear skin starts with clear pores. Night after night, this active gel helps keep your pores clear, gently. Noticeable results after the first week. Neutrogena Clear Pore Treatment. At Mothercare, we're always on the lookout for something new. But to keep our clothes looking their best, we only recommend one biological detergent, Ariel. The Nokia 5110 is the first mobile phone with covers you can change yourself in seconds. For freedom of expression, the Nokia 5110 with Nokia Express on covers. Nokia, connecting people. <sighs> Flash pine. All oh, those crisp alpine slopes. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Safer back here, though. Outdoor freshness in a flash. Uh, yeah, I've just had it re-sprayed. Uh, Raging Bull Red with Super Sheen metallic finish. Nice, isn't it? The dysentery beige wasn't exactly yet a babe magnet. <clears throat> anyway, I had to save a few bob to uh, get it done, so I sort of forgot to pay my TV licence. <laughs> and uh, I got caught and fined. Still, the lasses don't notice in the dark. Or, or if I stand here, like this. The Mercedes is one of the world's safest cars. It's extensively tested with full body rolls, computer simulations, and with head-on collisions. This one is at just over 30 miles an hour. But that night, the Mercedes was going significantly faster. Professor Murray Mackay is one of the world's leading crash investigators who studied the Paris crash. What do I mean by underrun? I've been looking at crashes for 30 years, and from a knowledge of how vehicles do crush in, in experimental crashes and conditions where the speeds are measured, you can, as it were, calibrate this crash. Now, the way you work is to start at the end, and we have the final position in the Mercedes pretty well defined. It finished about 15 feet away from the pillar, having spun off, rotating anti-clockwise through 180 degrees and a bit more. And that gives you an over-the-road speed, striking the pillar of about 60 miles an hour. That's like falling out of an eight-story building and landing on cement. So if you looked at 100 crashes, you'd only find one or two 
that are at this sort of severity. In fact, there are two tunnels about 200 meters apart on the road from the Ritz to Dodie's apartment. Eric Lee, a chauffeur, was overtaken by the Mercedes as he drove through the first of these two tunnels. I'd seen it coming up from quite a distance, and I would say it was traveling at about 85 miles an hour. By the time Henri Paul reached the second tunnel, the crash tunnel, he'd slowed down a bit. You can work out exactly what speed he was driving at just seconds before the crash. And that gives you something of the order of 78, 80 miles an hour. And that's, that's a reasonable, reasonably tight objective number. We're not having to rely on any eyewitnesses to reach that sort of conclusion. But why was Henri Paul driving so fast? The paparazzi arrested immediately afterwards have all claimed to the judge that they could not keep up with the Mercedes and were nowhere near it when it passed through both tunnels. However, many eyewitnesses disagree and describe, at different stages of the journey, a convoy with Henri Paul chased by cars and motorbikes. Eric Lee followed the Mercedes as it sped towards the crash tunnel. In the distance, he heard a huge explosion. I was going at more or less 40 miles an hour, still in the first tunnel when I heard the explosion, and they had passed me before the entrance to the tunnel. The time to drive along quietly, to come out at the exit, to see the car took me uh, a minute and a half, two minutes. The paparazzi have always claimed they did not arrive until well after the crash, but Eric Lee is one of several key witnesses whose evidence flatly contradicts this, putting them in the tunnel almost immediately afterwards. And this means that they must have been much closer to the Mercedes than they have admitted. There are about 10 people down there. Maybe they weren't all photographers, I don't know. I know that as I went down, four people came back up, four young people. They'd been arguing, because as I went down, I could hear them arguing with the photographers. They were attacking the photographers for taking pictures. They came up, and I was going in the other direction. I went down, over there, between the photographers. I went round and found myself facing the woman who was inside, who turned out to be Lady Di. Diana and Trevor Rees Jones were still alive. Though they were among the first on the scene, none of the paparazzi called for an ambulance. I saw the driver. I saw the driver in the front. And with the shock of the collision, he was thrown and hit the steering wheel. I still have this picture in my mind. It's terrible. There are three pictures that I always see. The face of the bodyguard, covered in blood. The face of the woman opens her eyes and then shuts them again. She seems to be suffering. And uh, the white hand of the driver through the steering wheel. It's terrible. Henri Paul was dead. Even though the airbag inflated, his ribs, collarbone and right leg were broken and his neck was snapped. Though he died instantly, crucially, Diana was alive when a doctor, Frederick Maillet, giving a friend, Mark Butt, a lift home, arrived moments after the crash. What were you able to do for the people inside? The lady uh, was still um, breathing, but with difficulties, and uh, she needed some help. So I ran back to my car to give um, a phone call to the emergency services, and I went to my trunk to take the only equipment I had, which was the, the embu bag, you know, a resuscitation mask. And I ran back to the wreckage to give assistance to the victim. All around him, mayhem. One paparazzi told the police, you make me sick. I'm going back to Sarajevo. The police over there don't bother us and let us do our work. Another complained, let me do my job, when a police officer pushed him out of the way to get to the victims. I mean, well, at least some sometimes they would go in for a close shot and back out. They were, but they did get get rather close. That was one thing that, that kind of bothered me was to see how close they had to get with a huge lens and get you know, right right on top within within 50 or 60 centimeters. While I was inside the car and giving assistance to Princess Diana, 
uh, I was aware of a lot of flash and a lot of, a lot of people taking a lot of pictures of myself and Prince Diana of the inside of the car. Since the accident, the police have raided the homes and offices and even the parents' homes of the paparazzi who were there. They have so far recovered only a few dozen pictures, yet that night hundreds were taken and some are now being offered for sale. What did I think? I didn't try to work out why they were there. I thought to myself that they were opportunists who were taking pictures of an accident in the tunnel for the tabloids. I don't know. A lot of people are ready to believe there was some sort of conspiracy at work, some plot to kill Diana and Dodie by dark and sinister forces. Surely the answer is it's too far-fetched, too complex to organize. How could anyone ensure the white Fiat Uno was in place? How could anyone know the route Henri Paul would take? How could anyone engineer such a horrific crash? There is another sequence of events described by some witnesses which does raise disturbing new questions about what happened in the tunnel. One of those witnesses is Francois Levistre on his way home late at night. When I drove down here in my car, I was doing 68, 70 miles an hour. I looked back in my rear view mirror and saw headlights, just like you see now. Driving a Ford car, he says he saw another car, then the black Mercedes, traveling behind him at some speed with a motorbike alongside. I'm in the middle of the tunnel. I can see the headlights approaching. You can see the headlights because it's dark. It's night time. You can see the headlights of the car coming with the motorbike headlights because you can distinguish between the headlights of a motorbike and those of a car. And the motorbike was driving alongside the car. Well, now we can say that it's a Mercedes. Well, anyway, the motorbike, when it enters, when the Mercedes, when it comes, it drives over the crown of the road to enter the tunnel. At that moment, the Mercedes, the motorbike accelerates and you can see the acceleration of the motorbike because you can see the headlight rise up a bit. The bike is accelerating. I'm halfway through the tunnel, inside, when the motorbike accelerates, cuts the Mercedes up. The police have not identified this fast-moving motorbike even though many witnesses have described it, some in considerable detail. Eric Lee remembers it as it passed him in the first tunnel. There was a taxi in front of me as we were going down. A Mercedes turned up behind me, flashing its lights at me. So I moved back over to let it pass, and the car went past very, very fast. Very, very fast. I can still remember the sound it made, and it was followed by a motorbike 10 meters or so behind. This motorbike is crucial because of what Francois Levistre says he saw as it drew alongside the Mercedes in the tunnel. At that moment, there's a big white flash. flash blanc qui se fait. Une grosse lumière blanche. Et quand a massive white light. I'm looking in the rear view mirror. And it's then, at that moment, that I see the motorbike. And I think to myself, well, I think lots of things. I think, why did the motorbike cut them up? The flash. Was this flash like a photo flash? No. No, it was stronger than a photo flash or else it was a massive photo flash. It was a big white light, like this one. Like lightning? Yes, yes, but quick. And it's then, when you're in the tunnel, and on top of that in the dark, you can see you're forced to. It's like a radar, a radar speed trap, because I've been asked whether it could be a radar speed trap. It's not a radar speed trap, but it was a big radar flash. And it's then that I see that once the flash happens, the Mercedes goes left, right, left. Initially, Francois Levistre was dismissed by the French police, but in fact, we have established that last month he was called in by the judge to give his account of events. Many other witnesses have also described the motorbike and some the very bright flash in the tunnel. 
So we set up an experiment for Francois Levistre. Now, Monsieur Levistre, there will be two flashes yeah. behind you here. The distance, I think, will be just about the distance you say when there was a flash in the tunnel that night. Mm -hmm. So if you look out carefully here. No. That's the first one. Yeah. And now wait, we should see another one coming up. Yeah. Yeah. That the second, second one. one. Yeah. That the was the second one. The second yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, sure. You're absolutely certain. Yeah, sure. Sure. Thank you. So what was that blinding light Monsieur Levist claimed he saw in that tunnel? In the demonstration you've just seen, the first flash came from this paparazzi's camera. But Michel Levist identified the much bigger flash, the second one, and that came from this piece of kit. Now, this is an anti-personnel device, quite legal to buy in the UK, which sets off one enormously powerful flash of light. Shine this in somebody's eyes, and they'll be stunned, disabled, blinded for several minutes. If you're driving a car when it happens, you'll almost certainly crash. We bought our anti-personnel flashlight in the West End of London for just over £260. But there's another version of this kit. It's not available to the public. It's infinitely more powerful, and it's used by Army Special Forces, including the British, around the world. Do you know the first meal I ever cooked for Jerry? Prawn cocktail to start, black forest gatto to finish, and a very juicy steak. Well, I thought I'd try and rekindle the flames. He does love a decent steak. Your local Summerfield has great prices on a superb choice of fresh meat and butchers in store who make it all easy by preparing it just the way you like. Mom, I can't sleep. Oh, yes, you can, sweetheart. Put your glad rags on. Tomorrow only, wake up to the original Debenhams 12-Hour Spectacular. Incredible bargains throughout the store. The Debenhams 12-Hour Spectacular. Millions of pounds off thousands of things. Only at Debenhams. Some purple stuff and this new Sunny Delight. Sunny Delight sounds good to It's me. got orange tangerine and lime with a load of lovely vitamins. Brilliant. That's the last of it. No, it isn't. Thanks, Mum. Sorry, your mum. New Sunny Delight. The great stuff kids go for. Is there anything more natural than fresh air? Without it, you could feel uncomfortable. It's the same with your pant liner. It'll protect you all right, but what if air can't get through? Carefree breathable pant liners have no plastic backing. Instead, unique micropores let air circulate freely. All the protection you need, all the freshness you could ask for. Naturally breathable is carefree breathable. New Foam Burst Gel from Imperial Leather. It starts foaming instantly and forms an incredibly rich lather. After just one shower, you'll notice the improvement in the condition of your skin. And clothes will find you irresistible. New Foam Burst Gel from Imperial Leather.
seven paparazzi were arrested immediately afterwards, and that night the police investigation began. The focus was on the driver, Henri Paul. Almost immediately, it was announced that he was more than three times over the French alcohol limit. The pathologists also discovered something else, something very mysterious, the details of which, until now, have been kept secret. When he died, he had an unusually high level of carbon monoxide in his blood. Carbon monoxide can kill, but even in lower doses, it has profound effects. There is an overwhelming fear of, of doom. Your body is screaming. Debbie Davis suffered from chronic carbon monoxide poisoning before her condition, caused by a leaky gas fire, was finally diagnosed. Today, she runs a support group from her home for fellow sufferers. Your senses are all to pot. Your brain is deprived of oxygen. It cannot function properly. You can't judge distance. You can't judge time. In Henri Paul's case, the carbon monoxide level in his blood at the time he died was just over 20%. Once you've got a certain level in the blood, that then, if you stop the exposure, that level then decreases. And the rate at which it falls is about uh, half every four to five hours. So in other words, if it was 40%, four to five hours later, it would be 20%. So the level that was measured in Henry Paul at the time that he died would indicate that, say, some two hours prior to his death, he might have had a level of 30%. Dodie's blood sample showed no carbon monoxide, which means that Henri Paul could not have been poisoned in the Mercedes. So the logic must be that he was poisoned earlier, but that only deepens the mystery because here's Henri Paul, two hours before his death, walking down the steps in the Ritz without any problem. If the blood test was reliable, he would have had 30% carbon monoxide poisoning at this time, yet he has none of the telltale symptoms. But if you've got a level of about 30%, someone would have a decided headache. You would have real throbbing in the temples. The headache would be unmistakable. There would be certainly a, a lack of coordination. He, he wouldn't know his left hand from his right. It doesn't strike me, when you look at the pictures of Henry Paul, of a man who is really suffering. It doesn't look as if he's got a headache. He's not massaging his temples to try and reduce the pain in any way. He seems to be someone who is quite relaxed in his environment. In control, he's talking to people, giving orders, he's affable w with people that he comes into contact with, smiles at what I assume are guests and so on. It, it seems to be somebody who is fairly relaxed and certainly not in any pain. And carbon monoxide is not the only mystery about his blood sample. I took the Ritz security video, which charts Henri Paul over the two hours before the crash, to a behavioural psychologist to see if he could spot the telltale signs of heavy drinking. If the blood test is to be believed, Henri Paul should have been ill, visibly ill. And he should have also been showing signs of being drunk, having consumed the equivalent of eight scotches on an empty stomach. Do you think Henri Paul was drunk? Well, I don't think there's evidence from the video that, that can suggest he looks drunk. He wouldn't look at that not knowing what has happened and said, goodness me, that's a drunk person we're looking at. The pictures of him walking up and down the corridor are straight and smooth. He's standing very still. There's nothing in his demeanour from these videos to suggest that uh, there were any problems with his competence in the situation. Of course, if Henri Paul was a secret and heavy drinker, then he would have a high tolerance and might therefore be able to hide his state. But his post-mortem shows that his liver was in good condition and did not have any signs of alcohol abuse or heavy drinking. But it's when you put the two together, carbon monoxide and alcohol, that the mystery deepens further. So it's a complicated and, and rather strange picture, yes, it is. isn't it? But do you have any sort of a concluding thought when you're presented with this problem? Hey, what, do you, what do you think of what you've heard? I, I find it difficult to rationalise everything. I certainly think with a blood carbon monoxide level of 20%, which was determined in his blood, and a blood alcohol level of about 180 milligrams per 100 mil, that this would be someone who would have a much slower reaction time, 
would certainly be someone who would be slowed up in the way they did things. Uh, it would probably also be somebody who was in some pain. But none of those seem to be evident from the pictures that we see of them. So it is a bit of an enigma. It's impossible to overstate the significance of that blood sample. From the very start, it's defined our views of Henri Paul and virtually all our thinking about the crash until now. But what if it's not as reliable as we first thought? The more I learn about this story, the less clear it becomes. That blood sample seems, well, suspect, and the paparazzi were apparently much closer than they've admitted. Much in this story is contradictory, and that's certainly true when it comes to the life of Henri Paul, the man at the wheel of the car, who lived here, up in an apartment on the third floor. I've known him for 21 years. He was a witness at my wedding. He was a kind of a jolly person and would communicate with everyone and talk with everyone and just chat away. He was very bright. He was the sort of friend everyone wishes for. He was very well read, very musical. He played the piano, the violin. There's not a day goes by when I don't think of him. I also have to go down the street where he lived. It never goes away. I still live in the same area and I go to the same restaurants. So it's hard. Henri Paul was also a keen pilot. Just two days before the accident, he completed a rigorous medical to renew his flying license. The medical found no signs of alcoholism. For him, flying wasn't just a hobby. His flight logs show he was a regular flyer and he'd taken courses for flying at night. And in all, he had completed 605 hours flying time. He was a good man, no, we never had problem with, with him. And he was a very serious in our craft and uh, he, he, he make you, his job very good in, in, uh, in flight. He was a good uh, private pilot. He, he's looking for uh, progressing each time. But flying is not a cheap sport. No, a one hour flight cost 300 uh, pounds about on this aircraft. So Henri Paul would have had to have paid 300 pounds yes. on that. He paid it for that. Did you get the impression that he was a wealthy man? Not really, no. I thought. I had the impression, it's just an impression, that he certainly didn't have any financial problems. Wealthy? I didn't, I didn't think wealthy, no, but not poor either. Comfortable. Henri Paul's salary at the Ritz was around £20,000 a year, and from talking to his friends, he sounds like the sort of man who spent his salary every month. But we've discovered that actually he was much better off than he appeared. Whatever anyone says about Henri Paul, one thing is clear, this was a man with some very big secrets indeed. Apart from two accounts in a bank outside Paris, he also had three accounts and a safety deposit box here at the Bank Nationale de Paris in the Place Vendôme, just a few steps from the Ritz. Just a short walk away, he had another three accounts here at Barclays in the Avenue de l'Opera. But that's not all. He also had one current and four deposit accounts here in the Caisse des Pins, just near the Louvre. In the eight months before the crash, 40,000 francs, that's about 4,000 pounds, was paid into an account here on five separate occasions, each time in cash. In all, Henri Paul had just over 1.2 million francs in the bank, that's about 122,000 pounds, and no one can say where it came from. The Ritz Hotel is adamant that the money, the cash, did not come from them. So where could it have come from? I thought it would be a good idea to go back and talk to his best friend, Claude Garrick, who revealed an extraordinary secret about Henri Paul. All I can tell you is that he had contacts within the French and Foreign Intelligence Services. That's all I know. Do you know what he used to do for these services? What was he doing for them? I have no idea. He was very discreet regarding his work. 
A former member of French intelligence has suggested that the security managers of major hotels are prime targets for recruitment, and the Ritz, with its glittering guest list of the rich and powerful, would be of more interest than many. We also know that Henri Paul was in touch with intelligence services. He talked to his friends about it. Do you know that, and what do you think of it? It would be very sad to know that. Do you think it is very suspicious that he was in touch with intelligence services? Everything is possible. I think it was the entire period when he worked for the Ritz, 11 years. I think he maintained his contacts during all that time. Shown any doubt on his loyalty, that com his commitment, but you don't know. People can face you with a lot of uh, decency in their characters, and behind the scene, you don't know what they, you know, it's, life is, is funny. But the big question is whether any of the world's intelligence services or the freelance agents they employ would go so far as to kill the Princess of Wales and her boyfriend Dodie Fired. She had certainly made some very powerful enemies, and for conspiracy theorists, there are clues in her earlier life. Her former lover, James Hewitt, says that after three years, Buckingham Palace decided that his love affair with Diana should stop. Then came some alarming phone calls. The telephone calls were anonymous, but left me in no doubt that um, they knew what the situation was. And... Um, were they threatening? Yes, they were. Um, in as much as they said that it was not conducive to my health to continue the relationship. James Hewitt says he also received warnings from Diana's personal police protection officers and members of the royal household. He says that he even had a conversation with a member of the royal family. Describe to me roughly how the conversation went. Um, Words, similar words, um, words to the effect that, um, you know, your relationship is known about. Um, it is not supported. Um, we cannot be responsible for your safety or security um, and suggest that you curtail it. That sort of thing... Forthwith. That sort of thing was said to you by a, um, at least one member of the royal family by a member of the royal family, not immediate member, but yes. And who was that? I am not prepared to say. Losing a son and losing a dear friend, you see a mother just gone and left two sons, and I know those two sons, how much love they have for her. You can just say, okay, that's it. That's God wish. It's not natural. It's not way the way I had to take things. You know the way you see that's okay. That's God wish, but you want to be sure that this God wish, not other people wishes. Do you think it possible that there would be those who would wish ill of the Princess of Wales enough to sort of do something really terrible to her? Um. Yes, I do think there are people like that. Um, I've encountered people who wish ill on other people for, for very dubious reasons. Um, 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 unfortunately, I think that's a reality. The threats that you'd received some years before, did they come back into your mind when you heard about the crash in Paris? Um, yes, they did. I'm a great believer in God. And if it is not God's wish for those two wonderful people to go... Well, that's it. That's what happens on Take a Big Funny Night tonight, but a lot of fun. Join us next week. Say goodnight, Sasha. Good night.